Um, well, I expected to have uh, here uh, three people uh, with uh, not, ma uh, not too much background in the CS, so I uh, prepared the presentation that goes rather slowly, but now I can go fast. <laughs> Uh, okay, so that I so toward the better formula lower bounds and information complexity approach to KRW conjecture. Hmm. Okay, so uh, what's our uh, goal in complexity theory? To prove hardness. We want to prove that P is different than NP. We want to prove that some uh, functions are different to compute. And one model we use is Boolean circuits. Which are those diagraphs with whose, ga whose vertices are called gates and are labeled with and or and not? And we would like to prove results of the following form: a function f uh, from n bits to one bit does not have circuits of size n to the omega of one. That is, does not have or super polynomial circuit lower bounds. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh. So oh. oh, okay. Or maybe uh, omega, capital omega. Uh, okay, maybe the function. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, sorry. Okay, and um, we and we focus on uh, explicit uh, functions, uh, functions that uh, can be computed in some way, because uh, a random function trivially has exponential uh, lower bounds. And uh, we so say for the purposes of this talk that actually for the purposes of this talk, an explicit function will be in p, Beca and because of this, uh, those non-uniformity issues. We want to prove non-uniform lower bounds against functions in P. And in this talk, whenever I'm talking about a Boolean circuit, I'll refer to fan in to circuits with uh, fan in two. It's uh, easier this way. So, uh, as we all know, uh, proving a general circuit lower bounds is very hard, and we want to prove uh, hardness uh, for, and therefore we start by trying to prove hardness for simpler models and. Hopefully, this will lead us to general circuits. And in this talk, we will uh, focus on uh, circuits uh, of logarithmic depth and on formulas. So uh, when we talk about the depth of a circuit, we refer to the length of the longest path from, the input, from an input to an output. By the way, I am going over this part fast because I assume that uh, people here know it, but if I'm going too fast for someone, please stop me. So, uh, and the depth uh, captures, in a way, uh, how parallelizable the computation is. Because uh, this is uh, less how much computation do we need to do, how many gates we have, and really how much time it takes to get in from the input to the output, assuming we have many gates in the middle. And, uh, we, and in this talk, we'll focus on circuits of depth O of log n. And one uh, important definition in this regard is the depth complexity of a function, which is just the depth of the shallowest circuit computing f. Oh, and our goal. Uh, more explicitly, is an explicit function that has super logarithmic depth. Okay, the next model is formulas, which are circuits with fan out one, which means that they are trig. And intuitively, it means that they cannot, s that they model computations that cannot store intermediate results. Therefore, uh, they are related in some ways to computation with uh, small space. And, uh, since formulas are trees, uh, um, it's convenient to measure their size not in terms of the number of vertices, but as the number of leaves. And 
for trees, this is uh, the same up to factor of two or something. And we define the formula complexity of a function by the size of the smallest formula for f. And again, we would like formula with a uh, super polynomial uh, size, formula size. Great question. I need to say that. We are talking about um, uh, the Morgan basis, which means that the gates are only and, or, and not, but we do not allow, for example, XOR. Okay, and now the, the two models, uh, log depth computation and the formulas are uh, tightly related. First of all, given any circuit of depth D, we can transform it to formulas of, si of size two to the D. Whenever we have uh, a gate that has fan in fan out say two, we just split it to two identical ga gates or two identical subtrees. Um, each of them has one upgoing wire. And uh, after we do this long process, since we get a binary tree of depth D, the size can be at most two to the D, which would be polynomial in N in this case. On the other hand, and this is a less trivial fact, uh, given uh, every formula of size S, uh, we can transform it into a circuit, actually a formula of depth uh, of log S. Uh, and if the formula was of polynomial size, we get a, a new formula of uh, depth uh, O of log N. This is uh, called spiral theorem. And, uh, and in this talk, we'll be considered, uh, we will consider the non-uniform version of the class NC1, which given this equivalence can be defined in two equivalent ways. One is the class of functions with depth complexity O of log N, and the second is the class of functions with formula size polynomial, which is polynomial, or is polynomial formula size. Um, and it is a major open problem uh, in computer science to prove that the non-uniform version of NC1 is different than P, or even the uniform version of NC1 is different than P. And, uh, and this is both interesting in its own right, since it is related to parallel, to parallel time and to formula si and to small space computation, but both and also because it is tightly related to the long-term goal of separating NP from P slash poly and proving super polynomial circuit lower bounds. So this is a good time to take questions, if anyone has. Yeah, so those, this is a qualitative, uh, qualitative uh, uh, equivalence, but it's not quantitative. I mean, you lose something by going back and forth. Yeah, so some functions Oh yeah, it's, a, it's an open question, what's the tightest pr uh, thing we can do? Nice one. By the way, it has to do with, uh, it also has to do, as we will see, with uh, as kind of a compression, because a formula can be viewed as a tree, and uh, the depth and it has a depth, and we want to balance the tree. And in a, and when we talk about the equivalence to communication complexity, this will be very similar to doing compression. Oh, or in, in those terms, if I al already started at it, uh, it means that for this setting of communication, which I will talk about, we have some result of compression, but we don't have uh, an optimal one. Okay. So uh, now the uh, let's go to the KRW conjecture from the title. So Karchmer, uh, uh, Maurizio, and Avi and Ran uh, 
suggested, uh, or oh, sorry, <laughs> Maurizio Ran and Avi, um, suggested one approach to uh, this uh, conjecture of separating NC1 from P. Um, and, uh, this and in order to explain this approach, I need to define the notion of composition of functions. So let's take two functions, f from n bits to one bit and g from n bits to one bit. And uh, let's define the composition um, as uh, the function that takes m strings of length n, invokes f on each of them, thus getting a string of length m, and then applying g to the resulting string. Uh, Gilat looked, looks horrified. No? Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I think you saw your horrified face. Uh, okay, so clearly uh, the depth complexity of this uh, composition is at most uh, uh, the sum of the depths because we can always first compute f and then compute g. And similarly, the formula size uh, is at most the product of the formula's sizes because we can have a tree that computes g and that each of the leaves put a tree that computes f. And uh, the KRW conjecture says that uh, this is essentially optimal. It says that the depth of the composition is about the size of the depth. And uh, the point is that if we can prove this very natural conjecture it, or even weak versions of it, I mean, you can, you can put epsilon on one of those sides. Uh, so as and if we could prove it, uh, this would imply that NC1 is different than P. And uh, I don't want to go into the details of the argument, but uh, the basic idea is to take a random function and to compose it with itself for log n times. And why uh, is it helpful? Well, I need to cl argue that it, this function is explicit and that it has depth log squared. And so for the log depths, for the depth log squared, uh, I know that a random function is maximal, maximally hard, so it has depth about log n. And if you compose it with itself for log n times, you get um, a function that requires depth log squared. And on the other hand, um, it is explicit essentially because a random function of on log n bits can be represented by a truth table of length n, and this can be hardware to explain to the circuit, or you, if we want to do it uniformly, it can be given as, a as an additional input. Yeah, actually, yeah, exactly. Uh, are there any, sorry? Yeah, but actually one of the functions can be random. I, I don't want to give a definite conjecture because there is a whole range that would imply of conjectures that will imply the... Mm? Okay, so you can say right here uh, uh, dg plus d of f minus uh, small o of that, for example. Uh, okay. Uh, um, okay, so any other questions on the conjecture? Okay. So how would we attack such conjecture? Well, one way to do it is using uh, what's co uh, usually called kartner Vigdorson games or kartner Vigdorson relations. And um, on those relations, uh, are uh, on observation of Maurizio and Avi that uh, those questions on communication on circuit depth and formula complexity are tightly related to questions on communication complexity. 
And more specifically, uh, for every function f, we can find some communication problem, r of f, such that uh, the two problems, such the communication complexity of r of f is deeply related to those complexity measures. Um, specifically, we ha uh, the, formula, the problem r of f is defined as follows. Alice gets some zero of f. Bob gets some y of f. Uh, some one of f, and their goal is to find some coordinate on which x and y differ. And clearly, x and y are different thi uh, strings, uh, so at least one such coordinate exists. And this problem is not a function problem, it's a relation, because there are multiple correct answers. And of course, they want, as in communication complexity, they want to communicate the smallest number of bits. And the observation of uh, Maurizio and Avi was that um, uh, the depth complexity of f is exactly the communication complexity of R of f. And uh, as we will see later, there is also um, an alternative uh, complexity measure for R of f that is equivalent to the formula size. Oh, and I should say that uh, for Kautner Vilderson games, it's important to consider only deterministic protocol. I'll get later to why, uh, but it's really crucial. So throughout all of this talk, we will only consider deterministic protocols. Okay. So now, how can we use uh, those Kautner Vilderson relations to study uh, the KRW conjecture? Well, let's lo uh, look at how uh, the relation of uh, G composite F looks like. So recall that uh, those are that uh, we have uh, that this composition maps tuples of M, M strings of length N to one bit. And for the rest of this talk, it will be convenient to think of those inputs as matrices, of, as M by N matrices, whose rows are of length N. So Alice gets a, a matrix X which is m by n, and Bob gets an m by n matrix y. And uh, what do we know about uh, those matrices? Oh, of course, their goal is to find an entry of those matrices on which the matrices differ. And what are we guaranteed about those matrices? Well, uh, we know that, it, so, OK, let's think as a sort of experiment that Alice and Bob each run uh, it the function f on each row of the matrix uh, of the matrices, and they Alice would get some string A, and Bo would get some string B, and then they would run G on A and B, and now we are promised that Alice would get zero and Bo would get one. Now, what would be the trivial protocol for uh, this uh, communication problem? Well, the trivial protocol would be that they first uh, play the KW game of G on the strings A and B, which are determined by X and Y. They find some coordinate on which those two uh, strings differ, say the first coordinate, and then uh, they play the karchmer vigerson game of F uh, on the corresponding row, say the first row. And um, the Kartschmann-Wigdelson uh, con uh, uh, conjecture says that uh, this trivial protocol is essentially optimal. Um, okay, and intuit in the intuition should be clear. I mean, what can they possibly do? Well, the reasonable things for them to do is to play the f game of f on some role, because otherwise they don't use their promise. But in order to play the, this game on some row, they first have to find the row on which the values of f dif are different. And to this end, they have to play the game of g. Unfortunately, proving that nc1 is different than p is one of the major open problems. It's really hard. And therefore, the KRW conjecture is hard. But uh, in, the, in their paper, uh, they suggested the starting point. Would they be the worst example? So how much smaller can it be than G of F plus G of B? So, for example, if they did G of 
Um, I don't remember the river. Okay, so uh, as a starting point for studying the conjecture, uh, let's uh, define an, another uh, communication game or communication relation. It's called the universal relation. And in this uh, communication problem, Alice gets some string X, Bob gets some string Y. They don't have any guarantee on the strings except that the two strings are different. And they wish to find some coordinate on which uh, the strings differ. And of course, this is some kind of an abstraction or simplification of Carlson Zeroson games. And um, uh, furthermore, you, uh, you can see that uh, every Carlson Zeroson relation uh, ref uh, reduces to the universal relation. If you have a protocol for the universal relation, it trivially solves any Carlson Zeroson relation. And uh, well, it's also easy to prove, and we'll see later f uh, one way to do it, uh, that uh, the communication complexity of uh, this game uh, is at least n. Basically, it's harder than equality, than verifying equality. So its communication complexity is at least n. And now, uh, what uh, they suggested was uh, to study the composition of this game, which is, uh, uh, or the, comp the composition of few games. This game is simple. We have an easy lower bound for it, so maybe by studying its composition with itself, we can get um, gain some insight into the full conjecture. Of course, the we are not talking about a function here, so it's not well defined, this composition. No. So, uh, but just for developing tools. Uh, yeah, just for developing tools. Yeah. Um, but of course, before I get into that, um, this composition is not well defined at all because uh, I mean, the universal game does not correspond to any function or to any cartesian vigilance relation, so it's not clear what this composition even mean, even means. So uh, let me define it. So um, the basic idea of this composition is just to remove the relation between uh, uh, X and A and Y and B. So now Alice and Bob, uh, or to remove the, con the connections through F. So now uh, Alice gets a matrix X and a string A, which is an additional input. And Bob gets a matrix Y and a string B. And their guarantees are that A is different than B, which is also which also follows in the standard Kaltzmer Vedoson game of a composition, that A is different than B. And they are guaranteed that for every row or for every index on which A is different than B, the corresponding rows also differ which is also an implicit promise in the Kaltzmer Vedosen games of composition. And of course, it also implies that X and Y differ and they can find some coordinate on which the matrices differ. Um, and one way to see that this is a, 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 a generalization of the composition G composition F is the Yeah. Uh, yeah, I should have said it. The, the goal is again to find an entry on which the matrices differ. So one way to see that uh, this is a generalization is to see that again, every culture of the on relation of the form G composition F reduces this composition of the universal games. Yeah. Sure. Um, so Alice and Bob gets a get a matrix, Alice gets X and A, Bob gets Y and B. And, and A part of X, like the A, what is the power of 
no, no, A is a separate string, okay. and they are promised that A is different than B, okay. and they are promised that wherever uh, A differs from B, the corresponding rows also differ. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Uh, okay. So of course the corresponding lower bound would be to show that uh, the uh, the depth add up or the communication complexity adds up. So in this case the communication complexity of u m is m and of u n is n. So we would like to prove a lower bound of m plus n. And this was uh, proved by uh, first by Edmonds in Pagliazzo, Rudich, and Sgal at uh, 91, and was later simplified and improved by Assad and Wigerson. Um, so now, uh, okay, we have uh, we now have the current gap between what we know and what we want to prove. What we want know is how to prove a lower bound on the universal game composed with another universal game. And what we would like to prove is a lower bound on the game of a, fun a function g composed with some function f. And what we do in this work is, some is a, a next step somewhere in the middle um, in which uh, we analyze uh, the composition of uh, a function g composed with the universal uh, relation. So this is somewhere in the middle between what we knew and what we want to prove. Uh, so the ideal result or the ideal lower bound we would have liked to have is still have the, com the communication complexity of Rg, which is just the depth complexity of g, plus n. We don't get such a strong result, but what we do get is the following. We get omega of the communication complexity of R of G plus N minus this uh, lower order term, which for the setting of parameters where that we care about for the KRW conjecture and separating NC1 from P, that, that term doesn't really matter. Actually, we get an even tighter inequality, we actually get the communication complexity of this composition is at least the logarithm of the formula complexity of G plus N minus this lower order term. So uh, actually this uh, no, uh, not tight or term is, ju uh, is just the result of applying Spira's theorem to this logarithm. Great question. I don't, you could, uh, I'll re get to it in the open question slide, but yes, uh, we could also consider the other composition. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> so uh, we have uh, the, uh, Okay, so we have uh, the formula complexity here, and as we will see soon, there is a good reason the formula complexity comes up. Okay, so, um, oh, but of course I didn't define what this composition even means, so let me explain it again. So again, Alice and Bob get uh, X and Y and A and B, as in the composition <coughs> of two universal games. But now they have the guarantee that A is a zero of, one, uh, of G and B is a zero or is a one of G, which is like the composition of the kartner wigerson game. And again, they are guaranteed that wherever A and B differ, the corresponding rows of X and Y differ. And again, to see that this generalization is the correct generalization, now that every kartner wigerson that fixing the function G Every composition of the function uh, G with another function F reduces to G composed with the universal game relation. Yeah. I don't understand something. When you say this reduces to that, and yet 
the lower bound don't for this case don't imply the lower bound for G. Okay. Uh, I mean uh, this reduces to that. So if you have a lower bound for that, it doesn't imply a lower bound for this. <coughs> um, okay. Um, questions on the, this definition? Okay, so we'll get to the black one uh, soon, but let me say a few more general words on the approach. So our approach uh, is based on uh, a notion or a technique called information complexity, which is another complexity measure for communication protocols. Uh, <laughs> first appeared in a paper, uh, or some variant of it, first appeared in a paper of uh, Bar Yosef, J. Ram, um, uh, Kumar and Siva Kumar, and then uh, the definition we use today appeared later in a paper by Barak, Braverman, Chen, and Rao. Yeah, but it's not the first, uh, the first one was Yao, and uh, Right. Oh, okay. I'll give it next uh, in the next talk. Uh, yeah, but I think the second definition is closer to what we really think of. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. And um, it's interesting that this information complexity technique was indeed used, as Avi said, in order to consider direct sum questions in communication complexity, and. In our, in our problem, this is not really a direct sum. It's more like a pointer jumping problem. But still, there is some notion of you want to prove that solving uh, two tasks, that of the game of G and that of the game of F, the, two, the complexity of the two tasks add up. Um, and this technique of, oh, and I should say, the basic idea of uh, information complexity is to have this a complexity measure on protocols called information complexity. And we lower bound communication complexity by lower bound in the information complexity. And the information complexity, as we will see, is the information, information theory terms, that the protocol gives on the player's inputs. And the basic observation in our work is that one can interpret, in a certain way, the formula complexity of G as the information complexity of RG. And this is why we have log of LG in our bounds. So if we take the, uh, the intuition of the direct sum uh, of the information complexity approach to direct sum and apply it to our setting, this may mean that the correct way to, Im uh, to state the KRW conjecture is by the multiplication of the formula sizes, not, in the, not as the sum of the depths. Anything I can help with? No, uh, it's not. It's not even completely true. It depends on the definitions you use and so on. I, it's. It. I make it uh, formal in s uh, in ten minutes, but. Uh, but uh, it's, you can think of, I mean, it's an observation that we make. It's not, any it's not a very deep or complicated theorem. Uh, OK. So uh, we wish to prove that, um, so OK, why is information complexity useful, basically? So uh, we want to prove essentially this uh, sum, this decompos which decomposes uh, the communication of uh, G composed with universal game, ideally to the communication complexity day. Or what we would ideally would like to say is that uh, the players must talk at least this many bits on RG and must talk at least uh, this many bits on the universal uh, relation. And if we could do that, uh, we would get the lower bound. 
but unfortunately it's not really clear how to do this decomposition. I mean, if you have a protocol, the players can and send bits depend both of on X and on A, or, or uh, de they depend bo on both on RG and on RUN. So, um, uh, it's so for example, they can send XOR of, the, of one bit from A and one bit from X. So it's not really clear how to do such a decomposition. But one key idea uh, in this work is that uh, if we measure the information, how much information they transmit instead of communication bits, we, uh, we can do such a decomposition simply by applying the chain rule to the information. And this is very similar to what is done in the literature of on information complexity of direct sum <coughs> in which they use the chain rule uh, just to decompose the information uh, given on the direct sum uh, game to the information given on each of the individual instances. Uh, okay, so before I uh, go to the blackboard, I'll give one more slide about other things. So other contributions to this work is some basic observations on how, on how you can generally apply information complexity on for card transitors on games. Uh, then uh, we also have uh, we also suggest a next milestone for uh, this project of the KRW conjecture, and this milestone would be to study the composition of G composite F, where with G being a very simple function, namely the parity on n bits on on m bits, and we make some initial steps towards studying this next milestone. The first is well, if we want to apply uh, information theoretic uh, techniques uh, to the Kaltschmer uh, uh, Vigdorson game of parity composite F, uh, we need some distrib distribution over the inputs. And as we will see soon, coming up with how candidate how distributions is, ve is very non-trivial. And one initial step we do is constructing a candidate how distribution, which looks appealing for a few reasons. I won't go into it today. And the other thing we do is getting an uh, almost tight uh, result for uh, the specific uh, question of the composition of parity with the universal game. In this case, the, re the general result we have doesn't give anything meaningful, but for this special case, we can get a tighter proof. And Another uh, thing that we observed while writing the paper is that the proof I'm going to give today in terms of information theory can also be rephrased in terms of just a combinatorial counting argument without any reference to information theory. Um, now it's a matter of, per it's the same proof, it's just a different phrasing, and now it's a personal taste. Uh, uh, Dima prefers uh, the counting argument version, and he thought that we should throw away all the information uh, proof uh, out of the paper. Uh, personally, I like the information theoretic uh, proof better. I think it's more intuitive. Uh, and anyway, the information theoretic proof is what, or the information theoretic reasoning is what led us to this proof in the first place. So I find it useful anyway. And um, as an India asked, uh, there is another open problem, maybe a simpler open problem that one could try to tackle as a next open problem, the composition of the universal game with F. So the easiest way to define it is say that is instead of saying that uh, A and B are, zeros, are z a zero and one of G, saying that a and B are arbitrary strings, but A is obtained by applying F to every row of X, and B is obtained by applying F to any row, to each row of Y. Or simply, the, uh, the players get each a matrix X, and they know that if they apply F to each row of their matrices, they get distinct strings. And they want to find an entry on which the matrices differ. So here we would like, um, a lower bound of the form M plus uh, the depth complexity of F, or maybe the, log the logarithm of the formula complexity of F, and we don't know how to do it. 
Okay, so now I'd like to switch to black one. Oh, because it's a great question, uh, because we already know the answer for or and then. I mean, the uh, oh, if in this case we know how to prove it, and it's a trivial proof. It's and it's really tight. It's a, it's really log m plus and the. Sorry. Oh, it's great. It's just that the next milestone would be parity because it's the next. Uh, my son. Um, so that's a great question. We already know, understand perfectly the composition of the OR of M bits with a function F, but going from the <coughs> OR to parity seems to be difficult. Um, okay. So, uh, um, okay. How many of you are familiar with information theory? Please raise your hand. Okay. Um, and India? <laughs> oh, <laughs> everything that is written here. Entropy, mutual information, conditional entropy, chain rule. Okay. Um, and, okay, communication complexity, just the basics of what's a communication problem, what's communication complexity. Okay. <laughs> I'm not. And uh, okay, I'll, so I'll go with the definition. So I'll go directly to the definitions of information complexity. So the basic idea of information complexity is recalled that in communication complexity. Okay, actually, before information complexity, I'd like to say to recall one thing about communication complexity that's important. And that is, in communication complexity, we can view the every protocol as a tree. That is, uh, say, Alice uh, sends the first bit, then we can view it as a root in which, uh, such that every bit uh, leads to the sub-protocol, which is also a tree, which is, say, what Bob sends, and so on. This uh, view of the protocol as a tree will be important soon. Okay, and now for information theory. So, uh, Ellie, so in communication complexity, Alice gets an input X, Bob gets a string Y, and they want to solve some problem on it. And when we talk about uh, information complexity, what we do is to define some distribution, call it mu, on the strings X and Y. This is a joint distribution. And we would like to measure the information that uh, the protocol gives on those strings under this distribution. So we have two complex, uh, information complexity measure. Uh, the first measure that we will use today mostly is what's called external information, which is really the mutual information between the transcript pi and the strings x, y. Pi is a random variable, which is just transcript of the protocol on inputs x and y. And the second measure of information complexity or information cost is internal information complexity, which is what uh, the players themselves learn from the protocol on each other's input inputs. So this is the information that Alice gets on Bob's input, given that she knows her input, plus the information that Bob gets on Alice's input, given that he knows his own input. In most of the recent works on information complexity, the key measure is the internal one, 
but uh, in this talk, the important measure would be the external one. What we know about the relation of those two measures is that internal is less or equal to the external. This is not completely trivial, but it, it's a theorem. And it's also not very complicated. And both are uh, smaller than the communication complexity of the problem. Basically, because information is lower bound, uh, is upper bound just by the number of bits transmitted. The information complexity is under the measure is under the measure u, mu. Oh, sure. It's also true for the communication complexity is. And okay, in the uh, yeah, uh, in this uh, talk, all the protocols will be deterministic and zero error. And talking about the communication complexity under mu can be considered just as the expected uh, communication complexity. But actually, this won't matter much for the most of the talk. We will usually, be consi we'll usually consider even worse case. OK. And now let's see how those information complexity techniques are related to, uh, to formula size. So first, let me define another measure of complexity for communication complexity. So recall that uh, protocols are trees. So we can measure their size in as the number of the leaves of the protocol. So we can, usually we denote the size of formula by L. So let's denote by L of pi, the size of the protocol pi, the number of leaves the protocol three pi has. And then uh, L of R of F would be, or L of R for any communication problem would be the size of the smallest protocol commu computing solving R. And uh, one uh, implication of the KW conjecture is that the formula complexity of F is equal to the protocol size of R of F. It's a, yeah, easy theorem. Actually, the KW connection is, is even stronger than that. Basically, what it says is that for every formula for F, there is a protocol for R of F such that the two trees are the same. The formula tree and the protocol tree are the same tree. And same goes in the other direction. For every protocol for R of F, there is a formula whose tree is the same. Um, and now let's look what this measure, number of leaves of the protocol tree, what does it mean in terms of communication? So basically, what this measure says is how many different transcripts the protocol can exhibit. I mean, it's not, I mean, the, pot, the players may transmit 100 bits, but maybe the number of pot, uh, transcripts that are actually possible is not 2 to the 100. Maybe it's much smaller. So uh, this measure is how many possible transcripts can actually happen. And this already sounds a bit like uh, entropy or information. And um, uh, formally, what we have is the, the first observation we have is for every distribution mu for R. distribution on inputs for the communication problem R holds that uh, 
the information, the external information complexity is at least, is, oh yeah, at most, L of phi. Why is that? Uh, basically, because, okay, I'll just write the inner. This is the next thing I'm going to write. So, the thing is that the mutual information, oh, and sorry, here it should be log. The thing is that the mutual information is upper bounded by the entropy, and actually in our case, it's exactly equal to the entropy. Um, why is that? Because in mutual information is this entropy minus the entropy of phi conditioned on x and y, but for deterministic protocol, the transcript is determined by x and y, so the second entropy is zero. And this, is at most the support of the random variable, the logarithm of the support of the random variable pi, which is just the number, the logarithm of the number of leaves. So, but, okay, you need to say, if we have this inequality, why did I bother defining, uh, considering this mutual information in the first place? Why not consider directly this entropy? So as we will see, thinking about things in terms of mutual information will be useful and as in the proof. It's in some ways it's easier than uh, uh, thinking in terms of entropy. Um, okay, so uh, next I want to say that this is, this, uh, okay, Equal the inequality is actually matched by some distribution. for some there is some distribution on the inputs that achieves this inequality this much why is that uh, well we know that this upper bound on entropy is mat is achieved by the distribution that is uniform over the support of the random variable so this is exactly what we will do. The distribution we will have would be, we have this protocol, we have its protocol tree, we will now choose a uniformly distributed leaf, choose, a run, choose an arbitrary pair of inputs that leads the protocol to this leaf, and then choose this pair of inputs. And this will be the distribution that matches this equality, and uh, we will call it uh, a hardiff distribution for the protocol. Okay, so uh, in terms of time, uh, we should do break more or less now, but I think that maybe in about 10 minutes it would be better, so it depends on your preferences. Um, so you think I should go on for another 10 minutes, or would you like to take a break now? Hmm? Okay. Um, great. So I so the thing I want to do before we take a break is to show two examples of how this connection can be used. So one uh, lo one way to use it is to prove a lower bound for parity. So for the parity function, we wa uh, we know that the formula complexity is n squared, and now I would like um, to prove it using those ideas. So the cartesian Wilson game of parity is Alice gets an e a string of an even weight, Bob gets a string of an odd weight, and uh, they want to find the coordinate on which they differ, and now we, what we will show is to find a distribution and show that the information uh, complexity of this distribution is at least 2 log n. And a lower bound of 2 log n on the information complexity would give us a lower bound of n squared on the formula size. So the distribution would be choose the random edge of the hypercube, or in other words, choose two uniformly distributed strings uh, that differ on one uniformly distributed co coordinate. 
So this would be our distribution. And how do we prove a lower bound on the information complexity? Well, we first use the fact that the external information complexity is lower bounded by the internal information complexity. So this is lower bounded by the information that each player gets. And now, uh, let's look at those terms. I claim that each such term is log n. Why is that? Well, clearly at the end of the protocol, each player learns the unique coordinate on which they differ, because this is the definition of a cartoonist video game. On the other hand, from the point of view of Alice, at the beginning of the protocol, the coordinate on which they differed was uniformly distributed. She didn't know anything about it. So at the end of the protocol, Alice gained log n bits of information, and same goes for Bob. So all in all, we get a lower bound of 2 log n. The second uh, lower bound I want to show is for the universal game. Actually, no, actually, I'll do it after the break. I'll do it after the break. So the, na so the next thing I want to say is just that there is an interesting difference between the way I describe the hardest distribution in this proposition and the way I use the hard distribution here. Uh, in the proposition here, uh, the hardest distribution is depends on the protocol. It's not the hardest distribution for the relation R. It's the hardest distribution for a particular protocol pi because I chose a random leaf of the protocol tree and chose a pair of this leaf. But the distribution depends on the protocol. Here, the hard distribution did not depend on the protocol. It was the same distribution for all protocols. And this is a curious difference. In most of the information to your uh, complexity literature, we always use protocol independent distributions. But here, it's we, I insisted on using a protocol dependent distribution. So it's a natural question. I mean, can we always use protocol independent distributions? And the answer is strictly no. Uh, the, be the best you can do with protocol independent distributions is parity. You can't get it better than 2 log n. I don't have time to go into the argument, but basically it's, beca it's because cartoon videos and games have very efficient uh, randomized protocols that allows one to find the coordinate. On Actually, the universal game has a very efficient uni randomized protocol. And is 2 log n, yeah. So every problem can be solved with 2 log n. Uh, and if you apply the Yao min max principle, you get that for every distribution, there is a very efficient deterministic protocol. So the only thing, so if you want to get a lower bound of above 2 log n, you have to use distributions that are protocol dependent. Okay, so let's take a break now. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is uh, to see how the how we can use information to uh, information complexity to prove a lower bound on the universal game. Information complexity is not really necessary. That's, uh, there is even a simpler way to do it, but it would serve as a good warm up to our the, the actual proof. So. Um, so in order to prove a lower bound on the universal game, I'll first uh, use cheating, uh, but I'll claim it's not a very important cheating. So the cheating would be, the way I defined the universal uh, relation was Alice and Bob get different strings, and uh, they want to find the coordinate on which they differ. Now I will say, 
Well, actually, I'm allowing myself to cheat them and to give them the same string, but in this case, they are allowed to reject. And uh, given this cheating, it's very easy to prove a lower bound because then the game simply reduces to equality, or actually equality reduces to E. Checking equality is reduces, to it, reduces to it, but they claim it doesn't change the complexity by too much because if they had a protocol for the game without the cheating, which in which they get distinct strings and can find the coordinate on which they differ, then they can solve the extended game by, uh, okay, they get two strings, they don't know if they are distinct or not, but they apply the original protocol as if the strings were distinct, they end up with some coordinate on which they are supposed to differ, and then they just exchange two more bits to check whether they actually disagree on this coordinate. And if they find that they agree on these coordinates and they f reject, they fail. So uh, the only difference in this cheating is the difference of two bits in the complexity. So now really there is no point in proving a lower bound, but I will do it anyhow. So um, uh, the nice thing about this cheating is that, uh, well, remember what I said before the break that there are no protocol independent hard distributions? Well, now that uh, we allowed uh, this cheating and allowed them to get uh, the same string, uh, we have protocol independent, a uh, protocol independent hand distribution. And this is because uh, the true log n protocol for Cardinal realism game or for the universal game does not work when we use this cheating. Uh, so what would be the hard distribution? The hard distribution would be give them the same string and let it be a, uni uh, a uniformly distributed string. So we just choose x equals y uniformly distributed. And now I would like to prove uh, a lower bound on the information complexity of this distribution. Well, how will I do it? I need to lower bound this expression. Well, this expression is edge of x minus edge of x conditioned on phi. Now this is n, and I claim that uh, <coughs> this is zero. Why is that? Because under this distribution, the players uh, must fail. But if they fail, it means that they are convinced that they have exactly the same string. However, if this entropy was bigger than zero, it would mean that there exists some transcript on which the players fail, uh, but there are two different strings that lead to this transcript. So I could use the rectangle property of communication protocols to give them two distinct strings on which they fail, and this would mean that the protocol errs. So. Exactly. It's, in, it's crucial that uh, the protocol has to work even outside the support of the distribution. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So this is the proof. And now let's go to the proof of the main result. So. In the main result, I would like to introduce a similar cheating, which will also make our life much easier. By the way, both for the universal game and for uh, the main result, we can work without this cheating. It just makes our life significantly more difficult. And it may be, uh, mostly we really have to, in for the universal game, for example, we will have to construct some protocol dependent distribution that mimics this hard distribution in some way. And the same would go for the main result and that would make our life much more difficult. Um, so the cheating for the main result would be as follows. So let me redefine the protocol problem G composed with U N. Exactly. Exactly. 
So what the, so um, how, let's recall how this game works. Uh, we have Alice and we have Bob. And Alice gets X and A. Bob gets Y and B. And in my original definition, I claim that uh, I promise that if there exists for, that for every index on which a and b differ, the corresponding rows differ. Now I'm modifying this definition and saying, if there exists some j such that a j is different than b j, but the j rows agree, players may fail. They don't have to fail. They are still allowed to output a coordinate on which x and y differ. But they are also allowed, uh, they are also allowed to say, well, you are trying to cheat us. We don't agree to play under uh, those terms. What? Yeah, they are not allowed to output something that is wrong. They are, allow they are allowed to fail. They are not allowed to err. They are allowed to reject. Actually, yeah, maybe we should just say reject. They are allowed to refuse to play with me. Um, okay. So... Um, I would like to, pro uh, to prove a lower bound for this game. And yeah, so what we will actually prove is the following. The logarithm of the protocol size this problem, or equivalently, the. Uh, no, no. I, okay, I will have a protocol dependent distribution because we don't only have the universal relation, we also have G. Um, so the result we'll prove is the following. And again, and we'll do it by defining some distribution, some distribution such that if we put here the corresponding informations, we'll have the required result. So okay, let me move to that board. So what I want to do is to define some protocol dependent distribution that will give me what I want. So uh, let's say, um, uh, let's fix some protocol, and before I describe the distribution, let me describe how we, my argument would go. So I want to analyze the information that pi gives on x, y, a, b. And as I described, uh, and before, I will want to use the chain rule to decompose the two parts of the protocol. So I will decompose it as follows. This information, the information that pi gives on x and y, and the information that it gives on a and b conditioned on x to y. Basically, this is the, the information the protocol gives on the universal part, and this is the information it gives on the g part. 
and I would like to choose the distribution such that this would be, here I'll have a hard distribution for the universal game, and here I'll have a hard distribution for RG. So this, choosing a hard distribution for the universal game is easy. I know what's the hard distribution for the universal game. So this means that uh, I, I give them the same matrix, And I, I choose some uniformly distributed matrix X, and I give both of them X. Uh, so now, so this would be the XY part of the hard distribution. Now uh, the question remains, how do I uh, define this, the distribution on A and B? And this will be more tricky because the, the hard distribution for, there is no hard distribution for G. Uh, distributions that prove a lower bound for G are protocol dependent. So this will be, so this will be more tricky and I'll get to this soon. But first I want to give a sketch of I how I prove this lower bound now. So I want to prove that this gives about N and this would give actually the log Lg minus the lower uh, uh, order term. So for how do I prove a lower bound of n here? Well, the point here is that uh, on this protocol, uh, sorry, in on this distribution, the protocols have to reject. They have to fail. So and the argument is a bit similar to what we did for the universal relation with our decomposition. If they have to fail, they have to agree, they have to be convinced that they agree on at least one row. This can be proved using a fooling set argument and we will do it. And the point is that if they agree on at least one row, that this problem of two players are given each a matrix and they have to be con convinced that they agree on one row, it's one can prove that this requires transmitting n bits. Um, for the second uh, term, uh, the basic, what I would have liked to say is that the players uh, now have to solve uh, G on this hard distribution for G and uh, therefore uh, they have to transmit at least log LG bits. The problem is that it's not true. They don't have to solve uh, the game of G. Why? I mean, they can just, you know, Alice can send Bob her whole matrix and Bob can say whether uh, they should fail or whether they should, uh, uh, or whether uh, they disagree on some coordinate. Wh what is the entry they disagree on? So they don't really have to solve G. But of course, sending the whole matrix is kind of pointless. It's worse than, as in, uh, than any cost they would pay on solving G. So this doesn't really help them. And so the point is that uh, we co really should consider two cases. The good case in which they solve G and uh, uh, in which they have to spend log LG bits. And the bad case is the case in which they don't solve G. But this means that uh, intuitively th that they don't know any particular index on which they differ. And this means that say if j suppose they know that j could be any of one two three four but they don't know which is the one then this would mean intuitively that they have to transmit the whole first row second row third row fourth row in order to reject Re uh, remember in in this case they must fail which means that they have to be convinced that there exists some j such that AJ is different than BJ, but the corresponding rows are, dis uh, are equal. So to do that, they have to uh, solve equality for each possible value of J. So we will claim that in this case, they just transmit a lot of information. They can't afford to do it usually. I mean, they can afford, I mean, since we are dealing with expectation and information, they can afford to do it with some probability, say, okay? If Bob sees that uh, his matrix is the whole zeros matrix, he can send a special bit saying my matrix is the whole zeros matrix. But they can't afford to do it for most matrices or for many matrices. 
So now, now that I described the intuition, let me describe the hard distribution. So uh, I, the, the tricky part is to describe the distribution for A and B, which is a protocol dependent distribution. And the point is that the hard distribution on G for G was we have a protocol pi, uh, choose a random leaf, and then choose a random pair, uh, an arbitrary pair that reaches this leaf. And now we don't have a protocol for G anymore, so we'll have to choose to have to construct something that will imitate this protocol. And this something would be what I call the subtree of X. So fix a matrix X. sub 3 t of x is protocol obtained by fixing x for both players. So if I have a fixed matrix X, I look on the protocol that I get once I fix the matrices of both players to be X. And that would play the role of a protocol for G for me, even though it's not a protocol for G. Actually, it's a protocol that always rejects because the players got the same matrix. But uh, as we will see, uh, we in the good case, which we'll define soon, we can treat it as a protocol for G. So uh, how would the hard distribution look like? Choose. Uh, X uniformly at random choose a leaf of TX uniformly at random and then choose a b that reach leaf and this would be my hard distribution So now, given this hard distribution, I want to prove a lower bound on each of those terms. So let's do it. Uh, yeah. Yes, but it's more tricky because no, but, but it's more tricky because of the issues I mentioned. First, we don't really have a protocol for G. We have this weird subtree that always rejects. Uh, this is one difficulty. The other difficulty is, as I said, they don't really have to solve G. They can just send the whole matrix or something. Oh, yeah, de definitely. It's really a com this the hard distribution is a combination of the hard distribution for the universal game and the hard distribution for uh, G. By the way, the tighter uh, lo uh, lower bound for parity is obtained by 
just uh, choosing the distribution on AB to be the protocol independent hard distribution for parity, which makes all of our lives much more easier. Um, okay. So uh, let's start with the first term. So we want to prove that I phi of x is at least n. And we know that uh, this is the entropy of x minus the entropy of x condition on phi. And this is exactly m times n minus the entropy of x condition on phi. So the crucial thing is to prove, an, because this is just because x is uniform, it's true, but the matrix. So the crucial thing is really to prove that uh, this is at most m minus 1 times n. It's just as in the universal game where we had here n, and the crucial thing was to prove that this is 0. So I'm going to prove something stronger for every fixed transcript phi age of x <coughs> phi is at least is at most n minus one n to this end uh, fix the transcript or you can also think of the transcript as a leaf of the protocol and let B set of excess supported by pi. I did not uh, introduce this notation. What I mean by saying that the matrix X is supported by a transcript is that I can give that at the transcript pi I can give X to both players. In, uh, in other words, that pi is a leaf of the subtree of x. Um, so uh, it's just like in the universal game where we considered only strings that can be given to both players at the, at the given transcript. So now I claim the following. If we take any two matrices in T, they will agree on at least one row. Not necessarily the same row each time, but some row. And the idea is a fooling set argument. If we had in T two matrices that don't agree on some row, that means all the rows were distinct then I could give one of them to Alex, one of them to Bob, and on those, and in this case, they are just, they cannot reject, they cannot fail, because the failure requires them to agree on some row. But we know that for the transcript pi, they fail, so, this can, so we reach a contradiction. Now we have, uh, we use a combinatorial lemma that, uh, I think the original reference is uh, is it's a corollary of a theorem of Greenwell and Lovas, and Lovas, and it also appeared more explicitly in a paper of Noga, Irit Dinur, uh, Eud Friedgut, and Benny Sudakov. Every set of matrices T is this property has size at most 2 to the m minus 1 times n. 
this is, uh, I mean, the proof is rather, simp is rather simple. I won't go into it now, but uh, it's kind of an extremal combinatorics uh, lemma. Uh, the easiest way to see it is just to, say to stop thinking of the elements in the set as matrices and start thinking of them just as strings with some large alphabet. In this case, the alphabet would be of size 2 to the n. So you have a set of strings in which every two strings agree on, a co on at least one coordinate, and you want to prove that the optimal thing to uh, do in constructing such a set is just to fix one coordinate and take all the strings that have this fixed uh, uh, coordinate. And there are such kind of results in extremal combinatorics, and this is what they do. Hmm? Yeah, that's the most trivial corollary of their uh, of their theorem. Yeah. 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 Actually, no guy is right. There is actually a, a stronger theorem saying that the only extremal examples are those in which one row is fixed. So essentially, the only thing that Ellis and Bogue can do is just to transmit one row and be convinced that this is the row they agree on. Okay. So now we go to the second part, and the second part is more tricky. Um, hmm, which board do I want to erase? Um, hmm, difficult choice. Let's do this one. Hmm? Uh, actually, yeah, I can erase this. It's counterintuitive, but I guess I can. Uh, is is it okay that I raise this board or anyone? I don't know. I think them to forget it uh, completely. Uh, we want them to solve the other question. Remember. <laughs> So the second term is more complicated, and really we want to partition the cases to the two cases, the good case in which they uh, solve G and uh, the cases in which they w do not solve G. So we have this term, I, I, A, B, condition on X. And the thing that will separate those two cases is the choice of the matrix X. We will have good matrices such that when we fix this matrix, the tree <laughs> TX does solve the function G, and the ma those better matrices for which the tree TX does not solve G. And we will prove that for good matrices, this is about log LG, and for b and Bad matrices occur with very small probability, and therefore they don't contribute much to this, or they don't affect much this term. So, uh, but the tricky thing is to define the notion of a good matrix X. So, how do how do we say that they uh, that they are solve G if they always reject? So, uh, first let me. So. We we'll need an, uh, the, an auxiliary notion called we a string A that is good for a leaf L. So say that a string A is good for a leaf L. If and uh, essentially what this definition says is that if the player if for a fixed matrix X the uh, the players got to the leaf L and Alice knows that her input is A, then Alice n essentially knows J or almost knows J. Formally it will mean that Alice can isolate J to a small set. So Formally, if there exists a set J of N, small, 
I don't. I won't give the exact threshold, but this is some threshold that makes the argument work. It's about m over n. Um, so such that for every b in l, a j does not agree with b j. That is, Alice knows some set J such that she knows that she and Bob must agree somewhere in this J, must disagree somewhere in this J. And now, so, so the next row now is just a W J, so it's not defined. Exactly. Yeah. And now, X is good. If for every a l that support x, that is for every leaf l that supports x, and for every a that can be given to Alice so along with x, um, A is good for L. This just means that in the tree t Tx, no matter which leaf they get to and no matter what input Alice gets, she always knows. Uh, she can always isolate J to a small set. Uh, okay, so now I. Uh, I would claim that if x is good, then this term is about Lg. And otherwise, uh, it's uh, x has small probability. I'll do the first part very hand-waving because it's less interesting. And then I'll focus on the second part. So, the re so uh, if x is good, then the point is that uh, we can take the uh, Let's look now at Tx, and I claim that I can convert it into a protocol that solves Rg without increasing its size by too much. And this will mean that the number of leaves in Tx is about L of G, which means that for those matrices, this is about log L of G. And well, how would I convert Tx into a protocol for uh, Lg? <coughs> Well, if I have such a good matrix X, I just fix X, and now in the game R of G, Alice and Bob get strings A and B. They will fix X, they will run the protocol that is induced by T of X, and now they will reach some leaf of T of X. And now in this tree of T of X, in this leaf of T of X, Alice uh, ha has an input. By definition, in this leaf, Alice knows some small set J on which he knows they must disagree. And now Alice simply sends J to Bob and sends A restricted to J to Bob. Now Bob knows where they differ and he just sends this coordinate to Alice. So this uh, increases the complexity of the protocol by j by about j times log m, which would be uh, O of 1 plus m over n times log m, because this is the threshold we choose for j. And this is where the lower order term comes from. So now um, uh, let's focus on the bad case. So for the bad case, let's start by observing that we can start by assuming that the whole protocol for the whole protocol for G composed with a universal game doesn't have too many leaves. Because if it has really many leaves, we are done. We, I mean, what we want to prove is a lower norm on this protocol. So let's assume for the sake of contradiction that it doesn't have too many leaves. Sorry, 
small probability, yes. So or even more specifically, I want to prove that, that there aren't many good bad matrices. And I want to prove an upper bound on the number of bad matrices. So what I claim now that I can actually say, okay, let's fix a leaf L and a bad string A upper bound num uh, okay should I say bed a or l and now I'll just upper bound number of excess supported by L and A. And the point is that, well, there are at most two to the M A's. The I assumed that there aren't too many leaves. So after I'll give an upper bound for that for a fixed leaf and a string A, I'll just take a union bound over all pairs of L and A. Now, so now, and now this proof would be very similar to the upper bound we had on the part, on the universal part. Uh, I'll look at the set of matrices supported by uh, L and A. I'll uh, prove that it has some combinatorial property, or I'll state they have some combinatorial property, and then I will state a combinatorial upper bound for uh, this, uh, for any set of matrices that has this property. So let T be set of matrices supported by L and A. I want to prove want I want an up some upper bound on the size of T. So what would be the combinatorial property of T that I will use? Yeah. Yeah, ideally what I would like to say here, what I would want, okay, idea, the ideal would be two to the m minus j times n. This would mean that they really have to send a whole row of x for each row, for each possible value of j. So um, I won't get such strong upper bound, but I'll get something close to it. Yeah. But that would only give you something like n minus one times n, even in oh. the real case. Yeah. So okay. Be yeah. Okay. So that's a good point. So let me rephrase it. Uh, having motivates why we allow j to be a bit large, and why we allow the players to have some uncertainty regarding the value of j. And the point is that, as I said at the when I discussed the intuition of the argument, our point is that if X is bad, the players have to send a lot of rows. So it's really wasteful. They really shouldn't do it. And, um, the, and uh, in order for them to have to send a lot of rows, I need to J to be somewhat large. And technically, uh, I, what I want this term, I want this term to be small enough such that even after I take union bound after all A's and all leaves, I still get a meaningful upper bound. 
this is why I want J to be a little, uh, not to, to be of size one, but to be a little larger. Okay. So now, basically, what is the claim? Let's recall what, what does it mean that a string A is bad for a leaf L. So for the definition of good is written here. What would be the negation? The negation would be that for every small uh, set of indices J, um, there, exi uh, there exists some B that agrees with A on J. And, uh, or in other words, A and Bob cannot isolate J for to any small set J, to any small set. For any small set, it can choose B such that it agrees with A on this small set. And this will motivate the combinatorial property of T for every small J there exists, oh, so before that uh, I had, uh, uh, I said that there exists some B, this will translate to some matrix, there exists some matrix J, Y, J, such that uh, every X uh, in T, agrees with y j on a row outside j. What's the point here? Alice and Bob cannot isolate the index on which they differ to any small set J. Uh, outside J. I'll, s I'll explain the intuition now. So they cannot isolate the index to any small set J. But we know that on this transcript they fail, they reject. This means that they have to be convinced that there exists some index J on which A differs from B, but uh, the corresponding rows of X and Y agree. So this means that for every small in set of indices that is suspected to be different uh, and B, they can't really be sure that uh, the, the index is found in this small set. So they must also be sure that they agree on a row outside this small set. Hmm? They, 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 no, they agree on a row outside this small set. I mean, all those uh, quantifiers make it a bit uh, hard to grasp, but it's really a natural explanation. And the fooling set argument, and again, we prove it with a fooling set argument, which is really straightforward. Uh, suppose uh, it, uh, it wasn't the case, fix the transcript. Now, let's uh, now fix some set J. Okay, if it wasn't true, there was some small set J that doesn't have this property. Now, uh, since A is bad for the leaf L, we know that there exists some string B, such that A, A and B agree on the set J. Now, let's take YJ to be the matrix that comes with B. I mean, there ex must exist some <coughs> matrix I can give to Bob along with B. So let YJ be this matrix. And now, uh, and now, since I assume by the contradiction assumption, there exists some matrix X of Alice that does not agree with Y, that agrees with uh, YJ on all the rows outside J. But now if I give Alice X and I give Bob YJ, I get that they agree on A and B everywhere in J, and they agree on all the rows of X and Y outside the set J. And in such a situation, they are just not allowed to reject. I mean, for every index in, on which A and B differ, every such index must be outside the small set J. But we know that for each such index, the corresponding in the in rows differ. Sorry, they don't agree outside J. They differ on all rows outside J. 
So in such a case, they are not allowed to reject. And okay, so this is a sketch of the argument of the claim. And uh, I'll just conclude by stating a, non a combinatorial bound that says that every such as every set P with this property is of size at most M factorial M minus J factorial times two to the M minus J times N. And I think it's a nice combinatorial question whether uh, this factor can be removed. It won't improve too much our, it won't improve our result uh, by much, but still it's a nice uh, question in extremal combinatorics. If we have a proper uh, set of matrices with this property, is the best thing one can do, is the optimal thing one can do just pick some set J of rows and another row and fix all of them and and pick all the sets of matri all the matrices that agree on those uh, on the rows on J and one fixed row. This would give yeah, a low it's not true in some cases where uh, they can fix M is small. So I mean we can forget about the M. So sometimes we can have a set of M so that uh, so you want to say that Exactly, exactly. I fix, I choose J plus one rows and fix them, and they ask whether this is the best construction. But the property is again not just that every two matrices is uh, agree on the rows, but that uh, every set J by J is one matrix. Uh, exactly. Matrix. It's not exactly the same, right? It's actually it's a bit weaker assumption that sa than saying that every two matrices agree on uh, on a row outside J. I think it's a weaker assumption. But mm. yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. Anyway. Anyway, this is a sum generalization of the case where you would say J is larger than two. Yeah. Yeah, this is in some sense a generalization of what we had in the in the lower bound on the information that pi gives on x. Okay, this is all I had to say. Thank you. <laughs>